Well, let's uh, take our Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> this is uh, the uh, quintessential communion chapter. And I've often uh, resorted to it in our preaching in, uh, uh, with respect to the Lord's Supper. And uh, I find it very... Um, a very blessed passage, one that truly I uh, uh, love to think about uh, in, con in the context of what communion means. <clears throat> now this communion service today is a bit of a milestone, not a uh, sort of a somber milestone. The Gal Martin family have one more service with us before their big move. And we're, we're very sorry to see them go, but we understand the situation and ask the Lord to go with them. Um, and the reason I mention this is, is to underscore something about the communion service itself that is exceedingly precious for Christians. And as you know, Cameron has served as a deacon for many years in our church and and has often been called on to be a part of the communion service. I've told him we can have one more kick at the cat this week, <clears throat> and that's what, they, what we're going to do today. We gather for communion services to remember the Lord until he comes, and the elements symbolize the Lord. However, there is more to it than simply symbolizing the Lord, and that is what the gathering together symbolizes. And I've probably said a lot of the things that I'm going to say today, I've probably said them in other messages, so some parts of this may sound familiar to you, although I did write this all up fresh for today. So let's talk about the reason that Paul wrote this chapter of 1 Corinthians. At least uh, from verse, I think it's about verse 18, or something like that. Yes, it's verse 18 or 17. Yes, yeah, 17 is where he starts this section. We're, our text is verse 29. I'm going to be looking at quite a few different verses as we go through this. Um, but the Corinthian church, Corinthian church had a lot of problems. As you work your way through the book, you will discover the many different problems they had and the ones that Paul addresses. The first one is a party spirit and disunity in the church. And so they were fighting with one another, sort of contending with one another, and there was sort of bickering back and forth amongst various groups in the church. And so after the first few chapters, Paul moves on to several other issues <clears throat> in the local church. In this chapter, he does come back to church unity, but in a different way from the first few chapters. And it's, it's in, a specific, in a specific context. The problem here is division in the church over the way they took part in communion. And in countering the problem, Paul gives us the most extensive teaching concerning uh, communion in the New Testament. And so let's go ahead and read. I want to start in verse, oh, this turned off. I want to start in verse 23, and we're going to read through to uh, verse 34. <clears throat> For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord." But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. Now that's our text, that verse. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. That means they're dead. But if we, are, we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are dis disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. All right, so that's our, the, the passage. 
The proposition for today's message is this. You need to discern the Lord's body to understand communion. So we're just going to rehearse a few things. This will be a very long message. But first of all, the elements. Uh, the bread is his body, he says. It, it represents his body. It's rooted in the original feast of the unleavened bread, the Passover. And you recall that as the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, they were in a rush, and they were told to make bread unleavened. They not wait for it to rise. Make the bread for the day unleavened. That was to be their meal. And then they were told to slaughter, of course, the, uh, a lamb for their uh, meal. And they were to take some of the blood and sprinkle it again over the door, uh, the door sill. And they were to cook it in a certain way, and they were to eat that, I think standing up, if I recall. And then uh, they were leaving that night to go uh, who knows where. They didn't know where. They were leaving Egypt. And, of course, uh, this became then the ceremonies. And the Lord uh, took the bread of the feast, and he compared it to his body. The New American says, which is for you, if you look at, uh, let's see, verse uh, 24, this is my body, which is for you. The King James says, which is broken for you. But either way, the broken bread around the table symbolizes the physical sufferings that the Lord Jesus would shortly undergo as he uttered those words. And he instituted, based on the Passover feast, he instituted for us this one ritual that is perpetual in the church. Baptism is also perpetual, but it happens once in a person's lifetime. The, the, the communion service is something that happens repeatedly. And various churches do it at different times. Our uh, church does it on a monthly basis, but uh, there's various ways that that is done. But it is repeated in the, New or in the New life of a New Testament church. It is something that is repeated again and again. And so we have the bread, the broken body. We have the wine, his blood, that represents his blood. During the Passover feast, there were several moments when they took the cup. Edersheim, in his book, uh, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, has a great deal of description about this. And he, he's, he's very good to read. But you have to have time because he's wordy. He goes on and on and on and on, describing everything. He's writing in the uh, 19th century, so in the 1800s, and he has that 1800s style where there's lots of words to say anything. All right? However, he says that this cup, as Jesus instituted the feast, is the third of four cups that night. He says, according to the Jewish ritual, the third cup was filled at the close of the supper. This was called, as by St. Paul, the cup of blessing, partly because a special blessing was pronounced over it. So this was part of the, the ritual they go through as they're going through the Passover. The Lord compares the cup to his blood. He calls it the new covenant in my blood. Now, the old covenant was also established in blood. So here's Exodus 24, verse 8. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So this is just after Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, the agreement that is made between the people and the Lord. And they say to the Lord, we will do everything that you have said, told us to do. We will keep this covenant. We make a solemn promise. And so then there was a sacrifice. And Moses took the blood and he symbolically sprinkled the people. Now, obviously, if you were way far back, you wouldn't get any of it on you. But, the, uh, but there was a symbolism. And the symbolism was that this, this, this death, this, this death of this animal symbolizes that you are committed to following the Lord, uh, and if you fail, your life is forfeit. That's what the covenant means. All right. Now, the, uh, uh, the, the Old Testament talks about a new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, The old days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And we, in the New Testament, are included in that new covenant. Now, there wasn't a lamb that was sacrificed, or a bull, or a goat, or a ram, or anything else, but there was the Lord Jesus Christ himself that became the sacrifice. And he established the new covenant 
in his blood, he says. And so the new replaces the old. And that new sprinkling of blood, as we take part in that Jews, we are saying that this covenant is established between us and God by the Lord Jesus Christ, and our lives are given over to him. They belong to him. Right? So when you take part, you're assimilating that bread. Your digestive system is going to take it and break it down. The juice is going to take it and break it down. The chemical processes, and it becomes part of your body. But there's a symbolism here that you are part of his body. That we are part of one body. All right? So all of these things. Now these two elements together refer uh, to suffering, and they refer to death. No covenant can come into effect without the death of a testator, just as Hebrews 9, verse 16 says, For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. And so those are the elements. That's what makes up the communion service. But then there's also the gathering. That's the second aspect of this. There is more to the symbolism than simply the elements themselves. That's what I'm the contention that I want to make. And I want you to just take your Bibles. I'm not putting this on the screen. But let's go back to verse 17 where this passage starts. Well, that thing isn't even on. Oh, for crying out loud. Oh, somebody should have waved their hands at me earlier. You tried, but you couldn't. it didn't work. I was having a great time doing this. All those verses were on the screen for you. Oh, well. We're not starting over. All right, so let's turn to chapter uh, 11 and uh, verse 17. I want you to notice these things. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. So they are gathering together. They're gathering together for this service, the communion service. Look at verse 18. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that, there, that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. So they're coming together. Verse 20, therefore when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, they were meeting together to eat the Lord's Supper. But he's saying, you're not really eating it because of the divisions that are within you. And then there's one final reference in verse 33 to coming together. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. So here he's talking about adjusting themselves so that they take part in the Lord's Supper properly. They observe the elements properly. They, they symbolize everything properly. But this thing about coming together, the, the intervening verses between verse uh, 17, 18, and 20, and then verse 33, speak about uh, the, uh, the details of their problematic gathering and the ideal of the communion service. And my point in illustrating, highlighting these verses is that the gathering itself symbolizes something. When the gathering is flawed, the church suffers and the Lord is dishonored. So verses um, uh, 27 to 32, which we read earlier. Verse 27, he who eats the bread and drinks the cup in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. What does that mean? That means if you take part in an unworthy way, you are, you, it's as if you have put him to death. You are guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So it's a serious, it's a serious matter. And so then he's called, the partaker is called, verse 28 and 29, a man must examine himself, and so in doing he is to eat of the bread, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Back to our text. So the crime is not judging the body rightly. All right? Or the King James puts it, not discerning the Lord's body. Not seeing the Lord's body. So the problem is not simply a misunderstanding of the elements. I think they understood the elements just fine in terms of what they strictly corresponded to the bread corresponded to his body the wine corresponded to his blood but they forgot what the gathering together corresponded to 
You see, we take the part of this meal not individually. We don't, uh, there's some times that they, they, some churches will take communion to their uh, shut-ins who are away from church. That really doesn't picture what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to do this gathering together as a body. Now, if you are coming together and there is a division in your church, you aren't discerning the body, you see? You aren't judging the body correctly. So the division that they were having was uh, that, um, let's see, I think I might be going to talk about this in a minute, so I might be getting ahead of myself, so just a second. My point is, uh, I guess here I just want to say, it is misunderstanding what the Lord meant by what the elements represent in all in the whole picture. The, 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 the elements themselves and the gathering together to partake of the elements. Those are the two things that are crucial for our understanding of what this service is about. So then the Lord's body, that's the last point that we want to talk about. So, what is... The Lord's body in chapter 11, verse 29. He who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Well, some say that means that they're failing to discern between the Lord's Supper and other meals. I'm saying, well, wait a minute. It says the body. It's not talking about the supper. It's the body that's the issue. Some say body... Here equals body and blood. That is, it's a shorthand for the elements. Thus, it's a failure to properly evaluate the meaning of the elements. That is, Christ's death for them. But others say that the body is the church, that which Christ created by dying and redeeming them. So here's where I want to talk about the division that occurred in Corinth because of their failure to discern the body. What were they doing? Well, the communion was part of a supper that was held by the local church, just as we have a lunch at noon every week. Now, some brought contributions to the meal, and, uh, but, uh, uh, but others did not. Some didn't have the means. All right? And the, and, and, uh, or others brought very little. And so there were certain ones in the church at Corinth who are saying, hey, you're not bringing anything. Well, you don't get to eat anything. All right? This was called, uh, apparently, it was called the love feast. <laughs> okay, okay. You, you didn't bring anything. You don't get to eat anything. Now let's have communion. Let's all take part of the one bo- bread and the one juice, and we'll be one body. You see? So by this action, verse 22, Paul says, they despised the church of God and shamed those who had nothing. Thus the unworthy manner of verse 27 involved dividing the one loaf which should be united. Look back to chapter 10 and verse 16 and 17 where it says, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. You see, the symbolism is the the bread and the wine and the body gathered together. The Lord died to create the body. His body was broken so the body, his greater body, might have life. His blood was shed so that the body, his greater body, all of those he'd bring with him might have life. The church is his body. The local church, of course, is his body in microcosm. We're not the universal church. We're not every Christian in the world. But we represent, by our faith in the Lord Jesus, we represent our connection to that one great body that will assemble when the Lord Jesus comes and calls for his saints. And the trumpet sounds and we will rise to meet him in the air. He made that body with his blood and he made that body with his death on the cross and his suffering. The church is his body. And so the local church should be united in this service at a bare minimum. 
and in everyday church life. That's the standard. We should love one another. We should be a part of a body that cares for one another and reaches out to meet the needs and does everything it can to help one another along in our spiritual lives. We are part of one body here. That's the idea. So that is the thing that makes this so uh, uh, moving when we think of those who are going to move away from us. You're still part of the one body, the, the big one, but you're not going to be part of this one anymore. So, as we take part in communion, what we are saying is our one Lord made us into one body. We're remembering the Lord's death until he comes, yes, but we're, we are uniting as one body to say this. And there is a bond between us that goes beyond flesh and blood. It starts with the Spirit of God who remade us by our faith in Jesus Christ and then gathered us together in this place and made us one local body that represents the one bigger body, which is his body, the church. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for what God has done for us and among us all these years. We thank you for this lovely friendship. We thank you for not only friendship, but a oneness in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that as we scatter in this world, we're not always going to be together, we pray that one day soon the shout will come and we'll gather together and we'll be always together with the Lord forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.